Welcome everybody to the lunchtime session. Thanks for coming. I'm Louisa Taylor. I'm the general manager of Canterbury Tech. I'm going to do a few Canterbury Tech updates before I hand over to Marion Matai, who's one of our committee members and the GM for Catalyst IT South Island. And she will introduce our speaker for today. I also wanted to take a moment to introduce Jennifer Hewitt, who's just joined the team recently in our newly formed marketing and events manager role. Um, she runs her own marketing and events coaching business called the Small Wins Company, and she brings a lot of marketing expertise to the team. So welcome, Jennifer. I'd like to start by thanking our Canterbury Tech sponsors, who without we wouldn't be able to uh, operate. So we've got the UC Business School, which brings us the most relevant MBA program and executive education program in the country. The AWS, who are also very well known for their infrastructure services, but are ready to assist businesses with a lot of knowledge sharing. So if you're exploring something new, don't hesitate to reach out to your AWS team and uh, have a chat with them. We're working with AWS to get the AWS Restart program uh, up and running again in Canterbury, which is training for uh, infrastructure skills. Uh, Lumen PDF, they have such a cool team in a new office just at the other end of Raora Park um, near um, Margaret Mahi Playground. They've just offered a fantastic discount to their PDF editing software for all of our members. And so we'll be getting that out to you all soon. Uh, we have two new sponsors that have joined us, Stratos Technology Partners and their um, CEO, David Carter, who's a long-term supporter of Canterbury Tech and committee member with us. So we're really happy to have your support. Integration Works has just arrived in Christchurch and they're busy expanding their team here. They've got a very niche job, which is integrating. And uh, they do it so well that we've decided to use them for our own integration to integrate some of our new systems. So we're working closely with them right now. Um, and Crescent Consulting, also a long-term supporter of Canterbury Tech, fantastic Canterbury recruitment company here to help you with technology hiring needs. So the US Business School has offered us a 10% uh, discount to all the members. If you wanna take advantage um, of any of the executive education short courses, you can email this ex exec ed at canterbury.ac.nz. It, um, it does um, autocorrect to exceed. So just be careful if you're typing it in there, it's exec ed. Um, and uh, they have some awesome new courses, which are really like um, future forward thinking things. So have a look at those. Uh, also our speaker for today, Tom has also very generously offered a um, new uh, membership benefit for us. So a 10% discount on annual subscriptions for standard or advanced plans of Carbon Trail, which you're gonna hear about all today. That's valid till March next year. And you can take advantage of that by emailing hello at carbontrail.co and mention that you're a membership to get that discount. I'm sure um, Tom will be very happy to follow up with you on that. So a few awesome events that are coming up. Um, Canterbury Tech has been partnering with uh, Christchurch NZ. We all know that everyone's looking for skilled staff at the moment. And so this very important piece of work is helping, uh, focusing on women who are either mid-career or wanting to enter into a career in tech and helping to break down um, perceptions of the tech industry and make it really inviting to women. Um, it's been such um, a successful uh, scheme that they're going to continue to run it until the middle of next year. And so if you know any women that are looking to make a, a career change, uh, I would encourage you to invite them along to this. You're welcome to come along. We did hear yeah. that a lot of women entered tech because men folk in their lives actually said, hey, you'd be really good in tech. So uh, if you're a guy and you've got some women folk in, in your surrounds that uh, need to jump back into an interesting career, um, think about bringing them along to this event on Wednesday, the 26th, 26th. Um, that's at Web Tools, and you can register on the, um, on, uh, the website at uh, Christchurch NZ, or um, in our last newsletter, there were some links through to that as well. We'll get that up on our um, website too. 
Canterbury Tech is involved in a couple of really interesting special projects which we're doing, particularly around skills um, development. So we know that about one in 10 people in New Zealand are dyslexic, and a lot of them struggle with um, the hiring processes uh, to get into work, but actually have really fantastic skills that are suited to the technology industry, such as really charismatic leadership, out of the box thinking and problem solving. So um, we've been working with Dorenda Britain Limited and Dorenda's amazing team of researchers and dyslexic experts to deliver Canterbury Tech's uh, first special project. Now this is around um, encouraging people to, um, to uh, attract, support and retain dyslexic people in the workplace. And the idea is that we will develop a blueprint which we can share with employers to help them to, um, to improve uh, their hiring and support skills for dyslexic people. Um, if you'd like to know more about that, just get in touch at info at canterburytech.nz. We'd like to say thanks to our sponsor, Vodafone, and our funder, Ministry um, of Business Innovation and Employment and obviously to our industry partners, Indie Technology, Trimble and Focused Software. And um, I just next picture, we've got a picture of our lovely team that are involved with um, Dorinda Britton there in the middle, who's been the brains behind this, um, herself being neurodiverse and all of our facilitators and researchers are also neurodiverse as well. So a real, um, real interesting um, approach to co-designing and a new approach to hiring. Okay, the next one is again working on skills development. Uh, Ara um, has asked us if if we could ask people to fill out the survey. So if you go to ara.ac.nz slash tech survey, um, there's a few simple questions which you can tell us about your company and the skills gaps that you have at the moment. And that will really help us to design better um, uh, courses and to identify key gaps so I encourage everyone to go in there or to let your HR team, team know to go in there we'll be sending out another newsletter um, prompt about that one to try and get the numbers up next November is the month of the tech summit and I, I haven't chatted to Alex this morning but I think as of yesterday we only had two tickets left so I can't tell you whether those have sold out but um if you haven't yeah. bought it and you need it, <laughs> then uh, you, you need to go and, go and buy it now. Um, so fantastic result that we've got some amazing sponsors on board for that. And we're very excited about the 24th of November to see you all there. Um, that's going to be a really fantastic um, day and an evening as well. Uh, if you did miss out and you're a leader in tech, there is another summit happening in Canterbury um, this uh, November as well. This one is really focused on um, leadership, uh, tech leadership, and it's offering a two-day summit um, from the 29th to the 30th with a selection of pre-summit activities scheduled on the 28th and an awards gala dinner on the 29th. So that's another interesting one. Some of their themes are around um, health and well-being of employees, communicating around security, um, how technology works in isolated locations and developing culture and productivity and innovation. So some really interesting stuff there too. We are a supporting partner of the CIO Summit. So um, get in touch if we can help you put in, put, be put in touch with the people organizing that. Some other great events coming up in November are, are the Kiwi SAS uh, group are running a really cool marketing um, for SaaS companies, it's a workshop. I'd encourage you to um, to register for that now. It's free, but it's got the amazing Serge Van Dam who's going to be facilitating that, and he's a um, Kiwi who's gone, you know, globally and got some really amazing experience. So um, it'd be really worthwhile going along to that. And then um, the people at Lincoln have uh, got a really interesting 
talk. It's a webinar about the next generation of food happening on the 18th of November. And tonight is also the cocktail party at the town hall for the Westpac Champion Business Awards. So usually we'd have the business awards today run by the um, Chamber of Commerce, but uh, unfortunately that being canceled. So instead they're having a party just to bring together business leaders. So if you're gonna be there, Marion and I will be there to, to say hi. I would love to meet you if you wanna come up and say hi. So um, in November, we don't run the in-person event because of the Tech Summit, but in December, we have our um, annual AGM and the, and the quiz night. We're just finalizing the venue, venue for that now, so we'll send out some comms around that as soon as we know, but, it'll, but put this in your diary, 6th of December. It's a free event for ind individual and company members only. Thanks very much for that. And I will hand over to Marianne to introduce our speaker. Cool, I'm muting myself. Kia ora koutou, um, ko Maria Mātai Toku Ingwa. Welcome everybody. Uh, really lovely to see a fair few people on this call. Um, and it's a, quite an important lunchtime event given the importance of climate and climate change that um, is has been having an impact on our planet. And there are a lot of worrying news out there about the climate and our future, really, um, and not uh, without reason. But instead of getting depressed and feeling helpless, I think the best way forward is to actually taking action. Um, any action, small or large, is better than none, as it will give us a chance to, you know, get make things better as opposed to taking no action, which will give us no chance to make things better. So. Taking action is exactly what Tom Helen did. Um, Tom founded Carbon Trail in Christchurch this year. And Carbon Trail's mission is to preserve the planet by helping businesses meaningfully reduce their impact. And that's quite important, the meaningful part, I think. Carbon Trail uses machine learning and big data to help organizations quickly understand their position and take action. And uh, we'll hear, hear all about this in a minute. Um, Previously to Carbon Trail, Tom was a director of technology at Jade Software, guiding the business on modernization initiatives and the transition to the cloud. So lots of interesting background. Um, and I'll hand over to Tom to talk, tell us all about Carbon Trail and the service he offers. Thank you so much, Marianne. I'm just gonna share my screen. So hopefully that comes through. Just let me know when you can see my screen. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm Tom. I'm the founder of Carbon Trail. And today we're going to be talking about how we use machine learning to dive a bit deeper into carbon emissions. So why did I create Carbon Trail in the first place? Well, we've got a global consensus that suggests that keeping global warming under 15 degrees Celsius is absolutely crucial to mitigate the worst effects of climate breakdown. And I truly believe that technology can help in that fight. Right. And as Marianne said, I've, I've been working in the tech sector for a long time. I feel like there's a real opportunity to use technology to give us those superpowers to help us to, uh, to, to, to move the needle and actually have an impact. And Aotearoa is my home. I want to help it meet its own targets. Right. Um, and I'll talk about those now. So by 2050, um, the target's been set to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. So that means, you know, uh, neutral, uh, except emissions from farm animals. And when it comes to farm animals, uh, roughly a quarter reduction of the, their emissions, so the biogenic methane from farm animals. But obviously it's not just agriculture that's going to get us there. And there's increasing pressure on business, right? Um, so, for example, regulation. Um, we know that for larger businesses, so banks, insurers, uh, people in the financial services sector, early next year, there's going to be regulation that says you must uh, mandatory reporting of, of your uh, greenhouse gas emissions. There's also increasing consumer backlash against greenwashing or perceived greenwashing. So businesses are fearful that any kind of steps or claims that they make are you know, going to be uh, taken the wrong way by consumers. Employee satisfaction, we're in the middle of what many are dubbing the great resignation, right? Employees moving to find uh, maybe more purpose or go to more values-driven organizations. So there's a really interesting driver there. And then of course, changing spending habits. 
consumers are starting to vote more with their feet and go for um, products and services that have a justified or a, a provable um, positive impact on the planet. But of course, knowing even where to start is tricky with this stuff, right? Actually, even understanding where you're at as a business is quite a difficult challenge. Um, and in fact, according to StatsNZ, many businesses say that cost is a key blocker to actually measuring or reducing those emissions. And there's a pretty um, straightforward way of kind of seeing why that is. Um, actually gathering the data from your business to even understand where you're at is often pretty time consuming and pretty hard in a business without dedicated resource. Certainly smaller businesses do not have sustainability leads or consultants you know, uh, or yeah, people who work within the business on this on a dedicated way. And actually, when we talk about regulation, the impact of making a claim can be, uh, or an incorrect claim can be pretty significant and maybe even, you know, lead to litigation or regulatory action in the future. And as I said, greenwashing is a real fear on, on the minds of uh, people, uh, organizations in New Zealand. And getting outside help can be expensive. So external sustainability consultants for many small to medium enterprises, it's just a cost too far. So actually understanding where you're at can be pretty tricky. So there is a global um, standard for measuring your greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll talk through what that actually looks like uh, for a business. So it's divided into categories and they're called scopes in the, uh, in the protocol. So scope one, uh, that's direct emissions from resources that you own or control. So things like uh, a boiler, coal to put in a boiler if you boil things, or um, the, uh, the the emissions from uh, fuel in company vehicles, right? Now, that's reasonably easy to get hold of in terms of actually understanding those numbers. You could look at, I guess, fuel receipts, or you could look at, um, you know, the amount of coal that you've put into your boiler. We've also got scope two. So that's indirect emissions from purchased energy. So like electricity, gas, steam and heat. Now that's pretty easy to get hold of because the electricity company usually sends you a nice invoice at the end of each quarter and says, this is how many kilowatt hours you've used. And you can plug that into a calculation reasonably easily to get a um, emissions factor and understand your impact there. But here's scope three, and it's pretty difficult. That covers things, your upstream and downstream activities. So freight, goods and services, travel, employee commuting, um, and especially in the goods and services space, that's a pretty big ask to go, OK, I need to figure out the impact of everything we've bought to make the business what it is today. And that includes the things you buy to create your products. Right. So it's everything that comes in your inputs and outputs. As you can imagine, gathering that is not easy. So I agree with this person here. Like, that's just too much. Right. That's too much data. Uh, where would we even put that? And right now, the state of the art is a spreadsheet. Um, but as a technologist, whenever I see a spreadsheet, I see an opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, really, um, that's why Carbon Trail was born. We, ha we have an opportunity to use data in a different way to get that um, emissions report and get those numbers and understand your impact. So here was the idea that we had. Why don't we use accounting data, right? So let's talk about that. Spending really does cover most of the activity in a business, if not all, right? You buy things to produce the products and services that you, you sell to your customers. Um, and it gives you that 360 degree view. It should, in theory, be kept up to date. I don't judge if you don't, but it should be kept up to date. Um, and it's usually very accurate because it has a sort of a knock-on effect to your tax. You don't really want the IRD knocking on your door saying these, you know, these reports are terrible. You know, um, th th this is not a good uh, tax return. So if you want to avoid that, you keep your accounting data up to date. I've got a picture of zero there. There are often APIs into tools to make that data available. And whenever there's an API and an integration is possible, that kind of lowers that barrier to entry to gathering data. And this is an important piece. Um, you may be thinking, okay, well, look, um, for each of my transactions, I could maybe, you know, apply some sort of calculation, but will that stand up to any scrutiny? And the answer is yes. For many scope three emissions categories, if you went forward to get, you know, try and get a certification or make a carbon neutral claim in the future, you can actually use these calculations for scope three emissions categories. So that sounds good, right? That sounds like a pretty good idea, I suppose. Um, but not so fast, because 
accounting data, while it's a, a font of knowledge and definitely um, covers a lot of activity within the business, there's often bad data lurking there, whether from the bank or from the accounting tool itself due to miscategorization. I'll give you a moment, see if you can spot the mistakes in this list of transactions. So a couple of, uh, I'll give you, give you some help. So Bar Yoku, a restaurant in town, we went for some lunchtime food and we spent $45, but that's not really a motor vehicle expense. That was a bit of a stretch to put that in that category. Or Web Dev Co, we paid this invoice, but nah, that's a development house. That's not fuel expenses. Must have put it in the wrong category. And when we went for dinner with Jen here at Munchies, uh, we spent $15,000. Well, no, we probably didn't, like unless we got like the gold plated beef Wellington or something or, you know, a really nice pie. That, I mean, that's just not going to be right, is it? And it goes on, right? So what I'm trying to get across is that it's not always exactly accurate. And if you wanted to start making a claim to say, hey, we're carbon neutral, but actually half of your data is based on erroneous calculations or miscategorizations, that's not going to work. So how do we solve this problem? So I'll talk you through the data gathering process that we use at Carbon Trail. So we connect to your existing data sources, so your accounting tools or CSV uploads or whatever that is. We categorize the transactions using a method I'll describe in a second, and then we apply the emissions factors. So for every dollar spent, this is the estimate of the emission, right? Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that now. But yeah, so like we said, you can't rely on pure transaction data. Each of those lines is may, it probably will, but may not give you an accurate read. So we need a way for the solution to categorize based on a number of factors, right? Not just the category, because that's not always the, uh, the right answer. So this is probably a good case for what's called a classification machine learning model, a model that takes different input sources and produces a output, which is a categorization. So selecting from a big list of categories, this transaction is most likely to be category X. So how do you create a classification model? Um, we kind of boiled it down into three steps here. So we label anonymous transactional data. So we take some uh, effectively training data, it's anonymized, and then we go through and manually add a category. So you imagine if it was, you know, in a row by row kind of setup, you would put a category next to each transaction based on uh, some rules around, you know, uh, what category that transaction is likely to be, whether that's eating out, fuel, you know, uh, plane tickets, that sort of thing. We then go through a process of training the model. So that means we split the, um, the raw data into two parts, the kind of the, the true data and then the test data, as it were. So the test data, we take all of the categories that we've labeled away and say, good luck, machine learning model. You're going to need to try and figure that out. And what happens during the training process, which we tend to run overnight, it takes a little while, um, the machine learning model, try, through a process of trial and error, effectively, iterates towards the categorization of the uh, individual transaction or the individual row. And that happens thousands of times a second. And you slowly build up a, to a point where the model is clever enough to start predicting against the real data. And then it's challenging itself. You can imagine a kind of battle between what it knows and what it doesn't know, which is quite fascinating. Um, and that training process then yields some candidates for models. We have some candidates to choose from, and then we test them. So we say, look, okay, models, we've got some really difficult or gnarly data for you here. Some, you know, happy path or easy data, but we're mostly interested in the corner cases. So we challenge the models with the difficult data, and then we see which model rises to the top. And that's the one that we select. We're looking for models with a really good accuracy on that test data. So when it tries to predict against that known good data, it gets it right. So how do we even do that? What does that really mean and how do we deploy it? So um, I heard AWS being mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. Yeah, Carbon Trail is an AWS um, tool. So we use SageMaker and that's AWS's um, uh, tool for training and deploying machine learning models um, and at scale. And that's an important bit that we'll come to in a minute. Now, Carbon Trail is a impact-based business. It's no good us just running, you know, hugely expensive uh, cloud resources, you know, burning through loads of fossil fuels when actually we need to be optimized for just paying for exactly what we use, exactly when we need it. 
That means we can keep our bills low, which is great as a startup, and also our emissions low, which is great for the planet. So that's why we like the pay for what you use model. It can also be managed through a tool called Terraform. And Terraform is a way for us to manage all of our infrastructure in code. So instead of manually clicking through the AWS interface and trying to remember what we did each time, we write it as a program and that is absolutely repeatable. And that's really important for us because we want to be able to stand by the accuracy of our tool, which means our infrastructure needs to be uh, repeatable and auditable. So that's cool. There's also two ways of deploying models that we use inside Carbon Trail. So we use SageMaker real-time endpoints, and we use what's called the serverless version of SageMaker, which means that that's only ever spun up when we need it. So it's ready kind of 24 seven, but you can basically just start it up, answer some questions, and then put it away again, which means it's cheap and has lower carbon impact. So we use that for the smaller prediction jobs. So uh, if a customer is waiting at the screen and you don't wanna make them wait for 15 minutes because they'll definitely go away in this age of distraction. We want to keep that under 30 seconds. We show them a video or a, a loading wheel, and that's when the prediction's made using real time. And we tend to use that only for UI-based interactions. But for things like enterprise prediction, when we're predicting hundreds of thousands of records, it's okay if we do that in the background. We say, look, come back in half an hour, you'll have your predictions. Often it actually only takes about five minutes. And what happens in the background is AWS SageMaker takes all of the records, spins up a bunch of instances, and then does the prediction, shuts them down again. But it's uh, subtly different to the real-time endpoint because it's not designed for instant response, which is cool um, and fits our use case really well. So what does this actually look like in, uh, in reality? Um, so every single day, you can see at the top there, we have a uh, effectively a cron job, but it's called a CloudWatch event in AWS that tells this ingestion controller, the, as in the thing that's going to pull the data down, go and speak to the accounting tool and pull back the most recent data. It securely connects to the accounting tool, brings the data back, and then runs it against the machine learning model. The machine learning model does its categorization based on the training. Remember that we've chosen the strongest, best model to, uh, to put in the uh, SageMaker um, endpoint and it predicts the categories. Once the categories are predicted, we do a further check just to say, hey, is any of this just absolutely ridiculous? Is this likely to be wrong? Um, if, that's, if that passes, then we uh, go to the report generator. We pull down the emissions factors. So if you remember, that's the given a dollar, how many kilograms of CO2 does that mean? So we do a little multiplication there. And then we put that into a reporting database for later use. So all in all, that process from kickoff, depending on how loaded zero is at the time or the you know counting tool, um, you're probably looking at about five minutes for that. And that can be for up to a year's worth of data for most small to medium businesses. So it's a completely different scale of, you know, you're trying to do this with pen and paper versus, you know, you're using a tool like this. So we use serverless extensively. Um, it means that we can scale kind of infinitely, which is important. Um, when you've, you know, you're a startup and you've not got a huge operation team, we can mitigate spikes, as you can imagine, at the end of each uh, financial year when it's time to produce this sort of report, that's going to get quite busy. So we can use serverless to kind of, we don't have to provision ahead of time for that. We pay as we go. As I said, that's really important for a business like ours that's focused on the planet and also a startup, so focused on our uh, bottom line as well. Um, and we've got that security, um, you know, we're already doing an awful lot. We're in line with the best practices and follow, you know, the various well-architected sort of frameworks, but building that on top of a service like AWS means that we can get even more kind of guarantees and make sure we can pass that on to our customers. So let's just kind of recap on what we talked about. Um, you know, let's juxtapose this against you having to run around your organization find all this information from various departments, the data may be all over the place, uh, or why don't we just connect to your accounting tools, right? Let's, let's you know, um, make that more simple. It takes minutes, not weeks, right? And that's really important, especially when you're a small team and you don't have a dedicated sustainability person. There's limited manual intervention required. We as Carbon Trail have some manual intervention to train models and to ensure that um, that's all you know, up to speed that labeling process that I took you through. But as a business, there's very limited intervention to actually achieve this number. 
actually cheaper than bringing in external assistance, though that is still very valuable. Um, and, you know, uh, sustainability consultants have a real part to play in, de you know, decarbonization and um, helping businesses reduce. But if you aren't able to afford that, then this is an easy way to do that. The model, and this is really important, science is always evolving. A key value for us at Carbon Trail is we are science-based. We're not just making this up. This has to evolve to be in line with the best possible science. And regulation will evolve as well, right? We've got the reporting requirements coming up next year, but that's going to keep changing, right? Especially as um, you know more businesses come on. So we need to be able to keep that up to date. And that's why doing this in code is a really valuable tool. And then actually, in terms of being able to make useful decisions, actionable decisions, you probably want to look at this on a monthly basis or at least a quarterly basis to decide, OK, well, let's set ourselves some goals over the next, this next quarter. What are we going to focus on? If you're able to generate this data on demand, that's much better than going, OK, right, you need to go and gather all that data again and sort of look at that. Uh, the look in their eye of, <laughs> okay, I don't really want to do that again. This is sort of ready for you um, as and when you need it. So, yeah, that's the reason we went down this path. We're kind of trialing this now. We're kind of getting out there with uh, businesses and starting to see some really cool results. So, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. And, um, yeah, I'd love to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. That was really interesting, covered both background, business background and technology. Um, and it's very clear you're a very, tech, very um, skilled technologist as well on the presentation. So we've got a question uh, from Alex here. Um, she says, um, does this have a way to account for differences between suppliers in the same category? Are buying food supplies from an organization that uses a lot of coal or versus an organization who obviously is um, you know, up there with the game and already is doing a lot in the carbon de reduction space? Yeah, um, a really good question, one we get asked reasonably often. So we approach this in quite a specific way. Um, the first pass of um, the uh, categorization, it will be put into this is a grocery store bucket. So it's sort of, um, it, it kind of averages out across multiple uh, across the entire industry right now if we are able to get a certified statement that says that they let's say in your example organic veg is next door they are carbon neutral right um if we can get that statement we can update our system to say whenever you see this organization or um, an organization that matches this set uh, this um this name or you know a way of identifying that organization we can zero out that that um, uh, that emission factor, if that makes sense. So in the report, you'll see that uh, organic veggies next door, they were seen to be um, uh, carbon neutral and that hasn't affected the report, if that makes sense. Awesome, thank you. Alex has another question, who went through and produced all this huge amount of training data? So um, we have done that ourselves. Um, so that's uh, a pretty huge undertaking um, through uh, you know, various uh, transaction data sets, including those that our, our customers have kindly donated to us. Uh, that's where we manually went through and labeled them. In terms of the emissions factors we use, we use the Ministry of Environment emissions factors and then some private sector sources as well. So a mixture of kind of us and then some great Kiwi businesses as well. Awesome, thank you. And um, what happens if somebody doesn't use zero? Yeah, great question. Um, so we also have an NYB integration, but we've sort of uh, made it that it's a reasonably generic way to import data into Carbon Trail. The um, an individual transaction looks quite similar, whether it's zero NYB or even just in a CSV. So you can send us a CSV file if you use a system that doesn't have a uh, an active API. Um, so yeah, there's a few ways to get data in, but uh, we're also building an API integration as well if you want to push data into Carbon Trail. Awesome. So we could potentially upload it online if it's just yeah. a CSV. Yep. Yeah. So we've got like a secure portal basically where you can push it up to Carbon Trail and we do the analysis for you. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. That's good to know. There is a question from Paul. 
Um, thank you for the talk, Tom. Uh, in 2023, what will the New Zealand government require for reporting emissions? Yeah, so the it's the XRB um, have put this forward. Um, they are requiring that larger entities report um, their emissions uh, inventory. Um, so that's the scope one, two, and three that I mentioned there. Um, there is a, a pretty good website that goes into that level of detail, but it's for the larger entities at the moment. Um, it's our belief that that will start to trickle down, but right now that is for the larger end of town. Yeah, I think that's the idea. It will trickle down to all their clients, all the people who want to borrow money or get insured, or businesses organization will have to have to um, up their game as well. That's right. Um, so the organization I work for has um, uh, reached carbon zero certification through TOI2, and I know TOI2 actually encourages organizations to add their data on a monthly basis. Um, so carbon trail would allow that to happen. Basically, we can upload data on any yeah. frequency and then upload well, to TOI2. That, that's absolutely right. So yeah, like if you, as long as there's an identifier of some kind for that transaction, so you're not kind of doubling up, um, then yes, you can at whatever frequency you like. We've got customers that are looking at it monthly, but like I say, quarterly is a also coming up as well. Um, it's as and when you're able, but obviously that upload could be for the previous six months or year or two years or whatever. It's whatever frequency or you'd like. Awesome. And then... Um... Can you explain a little bit more about emission factors? What are they and how is it, where they source them? Yeah, so yeah, like I mentioned, we, we use a mixture of Ministry of Environment and private sector sources. Uh, so um, yeah, what an emissions factor is effectively in, in the carbon trail world is whenever we see a dollar spent, what is the associated kilogram output in terms of carbon dioxide. And there's a few methods and a few methodologies being kind of thrown around to produce that number, but effectively it's a kind of a, an averaged amount across the industry. And for, for the instance of, let's say some electronics or, or a laptop, it includes the, um, uh, the, 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 in, the the carbon required to get it from the manufacturer into New Zealand as well. So one of the sources that we use kind of makes a, a a pretty big deal of, a, of that fact that, that the whole supply chain needs to be kind of covered, but it is an average, right? It's never going to know exactly how much that individual MacBook was versus this mobile phone. It has to be a kind of a, a, um, a an average and, a, and an estimate. But for things like um, air travel, for fuel, for electricity, that's where we switch over to the Ministry of Environment approved factors. And we say, well, look, how many, uh, so for example, in the instance of a flight, Carbon Trail can ask you, uh, where was that flight from and to? And we can do that calculation to go, okay, well look, per passenger kilometer, that's what the approved um, emissions factor is. So for certain categories, certainly those scope one and two categories, we can go that level deeper and give you an even more of an accurate number. So yeah, there's two different types of how we apply the factors, if that makes sense. Cool, awesome. and then we all switch to um, hydrogen fueled airplanes. <laughs> Are we yeah. going to be able to tell the difference, you know, okay, I actually flew to Wellington, you know, on a hydrogen fuel airplane, not, you know, the standard one. I'm guessing that will be um, in the mix somehow. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I'm looking forward to that that day as well, where we can get on those hydrogen planes. But uh, yeah, um, there'll be a factor associated with that as well. So yes, exactly. Awesome. Thank you. And um, Louisa is asking, what are the next strategic steps for your business? Oh, yeah, a great question. So we are um, in the middle of our Zero App Store submission. So getting it out to the wider Zero um, user base is going to be really key for us. Um, we're investigating uh, the ability to um, uh, offer certifications. So um, increasingly business are looking to kind of show their um, show their true colors with com carbon neutral, carbon positive, or at least even having measured and sort of seen their number. So we are looking at building out those certifications uh, in line with the ISO standard. Um, so yeah, we're, we're hoping to be able to provide a, a pretty good end-to-end -end service with technology at its core. Um, but yeah, plenty more. So yeah, watch this space. I, uh, I talk every Friday on the Carbon Trail uh, LinkedIn page about what we're doing. So feel free to follow along on that. And I'm sure you'll see that evolve. 
essentially taking on toy to competitive. I think anyone in this space is doing a good thing. Um, I think Absolutely. it's important to have, uh, um, you know, different levels of this like toy two that they are you know they're absolutely just leading the way and they are absolutely elite in terms of what they offer um yeah we want to obviously get to that point but we feel like that there's an opportunity to help even more businesses with you know different offerings yeah so then obviously if there are more certifying bodies how will businesses know which certifying body is the one or the couple that is acceptable well every certifying body has to be in line with the ISO standard, right? So it's then about a decision about which one's the best fit for the business. Um, what what Toy2 offers, one business may not be suitable for another. Um, and the same goes for Carbon Trail. So I think it's going to be about consumer choice. And I think being able to align around a standard shows that there's a level of assurance and, and quality around that certification rather than just issuing it to anyone that asks. Excellent, really great work, really impressed. Um, Lisa had another question on how has carbon trace carbon impact behavior changed since analyzing your own data? That's a really good question. So um, our values, we, we you know, we, we're pragmatic, right? We're, we're trying to create change where we can, um, but we also recognize that it's, we have to bring people on the journey with us. But, you know, personally, uh, it's made me uh, rethink, um, you know, my, uh, domestic flights you know um, I will hold as many meetings virtually as I can um, we are you know we, we we've got you know we think about this when it comes to our kind of office we think about this when it comes to the goods and services we um, purchase we we will only buy secondhand um, uh, things like phones that sort of stuff um, so we're trying where we can as, as a corporation to do the best we can based on the tool and the, yeah, the tool is giving us that insight that we never would have had before. So um, yeah, we're, we're definitely trying to kind of practice what we preach there. Nice one, walking the talk as well, that's great. And uh, Daniel is asking, can you give any details about the model architecture? Um, I, so architecture is in how it's deployed or the model itself or, yeah, Daniel? sorry, not quite sure. It's, uh, okay, so, uh, it's an XG boost model, um, and it's uh, that's probably about as much detail as, as I can go into. It's so basically, yeah, we we we've got those the training steps that I uh, described. Uh, it's based around lots and lots of input data, um, but yeah, we use the SageMaker kind of uh, process to produce that model and then uh, deploy it at scale. But yeah, the uh, parameter set is XG boost. Um, and that's yeah the way that we've uh, the one that we've elected to use testing a few different ones out. Awesome, fantastic, thank you. Thanks very much. I don't have any other question. Any other questions from anyone? And in the meantime, Tom, I don't know if there's an email address somewhere on the slides, but if people want to get in touch with you, where can they reach you? Yeah, um, I'll stick it in the chat here, but it's um, it's Tom at CarbonTrail.co. Um, but if you're interested in the offer just to give Carbon Trail a well for your business, then um, it's hello at CarbonTrail.co uh, that I think Louisa shared earlier, but I'll just uh, put that in the chat now. So if people want to talk, I'm, I'm really happy to answer any kind of further questions or anything that uh, comes to your mind. Um, yeah, really keen to talk about this and uh, yeah, hear about how your business is approaching this as well. Lovely. Thank you, Tom. I can echo Paul's um, comment. They're great initiative and awesome purpose. Well done. Thanks very much, Tom. And looking forward to um, seeing you everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Marianne. It's been a pleasure to talk to you all. And um, yeah, really enjoyed this um, opportunity. So thank you very much.